Behold, forsooth, on this yon veritable plethora of platters which doth spank. I'm having trouble coming up with cold opens, okay? Greetings one and all, and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. Spank and Platters is the order of business for today. That is my quarterly video in which I round up and talk about uh, albums that have been released over the last few months that have caught my ear, caught my interest, that I've listened to and enjoyed, uh, but which may not necessarily be suitable for a now and then style video uh, for no particular reason and through no fault of their own. These are still re really good albums. And yes, I say this is a quarterly video. And if I'm really sticking to that, then I should have put this video out a month ago because my last Spank and Platters video came out four months ago. And if it's quarterly, then it should be every three months. And to further incriminate my laziness, uh, the newest amongst these albums is actually, uh, I think, about three months old. So, but what can you do? I mean, hey, I'm doing what I can, right? Uh, you're, you're getting what you're getting with this channel. Uh, with some effort, of course. I mean, I, I, I like to give you guys good content, but, you know, when I'm ready to give you good content, honestly. So, anyway, without further ado, let's check out the albums that I picked. I picked out five albums for this video, so uh, let's get to them. Now, this Spank and Platters video is actually going to be a little bit more pop-centric than the last one. In fact, all but one of the albums I'm going to be talking about today is from the pop range of genres. So let's take care of the more unusual one first, the, the odd man out, so to speak. And this one is unusual in a few different ways. This is Spirituality and Distortion, the fourth album by Igor. And the band name is spelled with three R's, incidentally. Now, Ryan from True North Reviews is to thank slash blame for this one. Uh, when he reviewed it a, about a month ago, a couple months ago maybe by now, uh, he made it sound so intriguing that I couldn't resist streaming it right after I watched his video. And after I listened to it, I knew that it was something I was probably going to spend several more listens parsing and metabolizing and thinking about, uh, so I saw fit to actually buy it on CD, as you can see here. Now, Igor is a French metal act, which is essentially a one-man band by the name of Gautier Serra, although he does get uh, some help from his friends on this one. Now, some of you know that I do not care much for metal at all. I have maybe half a dozen metal albums in my entire music uh, collection. But I am intrigued by music that can't be neatly boxed into one genre or even two genres. Well, on this one, you'll hear everything from the blistering, slicing guitars and furiously pummeling drums of thrash metal to the lush strings of classical music. Honestly, this thing runs the entire gamut. And another thing that I don't particularly like to listen to is when the vocals uh, cross the line from singing into the screaming or the howling or the growling, but this is another way in which this album transcends genre lines. I'm willing to put up with it, just because this album is just such an interesting, fascinating listen. The vocals on this album, as I said, range from the visceral, guttural howling that you'll hear in the most brutal metal albums, which on this album is courtesy of vocalist Laurent Lunoir, uh, and it goes all the way to the most soaring resonance of opera-style singing, and that comes to us courtesy of vocalist Laurie Le Prunichec. And pardon me if I'm butchering the names, I'm sorry. Uh, and in one or two occasions, you'll hear both extremes of vocals in the same song. This album even has moments resembling Mediterranean folk songs, and you'll hear bits of such arguably off-the-beaten-path instruments as accordion in the French-sounding folk song Musette Maximum, as well as the sitar, you know how much I love sitar, in the bouncy and enchanting Camel Dance Floor, which, you know, by its name and the presence of accordion kind of uh, suggests that it has a, a Middle Eastern kind of a, a sound to it. And there, you'll even hear harps, harpsichord here and there on this album. And it's, it's just nuts. Uh, and one of the songs, even yet another thing that they delve into here, is called Parpang, which is a hard-hitting metal song with electronic flourishes that sound like they were taken from vintage 80s video games. Now, from all the stuff you've heard me talk about, from all the different influences and, and genres and instruments and stuff, You'd think that this album wouldn't work and would sound like a scattered, disjointed mess, uh, particularly since some of the songs switch genres halfway through. But for some reason, it does work, uh, perhaps because you quickly learned from this album to expect the unexpected. 
and to wait for the next left turn, which sometimes comes within 30 or 40 seconds. Honestly, this is this is such an interesting listen that you, you simply don't get bored. And the album is 55 minutes long, and you still don't get bored with it. It's, it's just one of the most fascinating and interesting listens I've had uh, all this year, and actually in recent memory even. And it's something that I never thought I would enjoy. I never thought it would appeal to me as much as it did. So, you know, thank you, Ryan, over at True North Reviews for turning me onto this. I, I never would have considered looking at it otherwise. And I'm act it's actually making me uh, think about checking out Igor's past albums. So yeah, if you're really uh, wanting to try something different and adventurous, give uh, Spirituality and Distortion by Igor a try. Very, very interesting album. Okay, the next album on the docket for today's video is uh, one of two LPs that I have. I have a mixture of CDs and vinyl today. And this one is the debut full-length album by Conan Gray, and it's called Kid Crow. Now, I actually hadn't even heard of this artist until I first saw this album on the rack at Target, uh, on CD actually, I didn't see the vinyl there at Target, uh, a few months ago. And I was intrigued, and I decided to stream the album when I got home, and, well, the rest is history. I liked it enough that I decided to pick it up on vinyl. Now, I will admit that I was put off at first at how high-pitched Conan Gray's voice is, but it didn't take me long, honestly, to get past that. Um, in fact, I, I've come to find the same kind of magnetic quality and allure in his voice and vocal delivery that I find in Troy Sivan. Although, if I'm going to be totally honest here, Troy Sivan's voice, just the quality of his voice overall, edges out Conan Gray's by just a bit, not by too much. But uh, yeah, he's still a perfectly fine vocalist. Now, some of the songs on this album deal with the more typically teenage things like love and relationships. Uh, two examples of this are Maniac, which has a more of an 80s vibe to it, which in that respect uh, almost sounds like it would be right at home on Dua Lipa's uh, latest album, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. And another example of this is the song Checkmate, which is an even more energetic and catchy song, but it, that one definitely has more of a 2010s vibe to it. More, uh, It's more of a contemporary feel to it. But there are some songs on this album that take on decidedly more adult themes. Uh, for instance, the song Affluenza addresses how distorted a young person's values can get when they come from a wealthy family. That's a very, very interesting song with a very interesting uh, message to it. And another song, uh, Wish You Were Sober, is an indictment on uh, an indictment of sorts, anyway, on how alcohol and drugs can affect someone's judgment and inhibitions when it comes to matters of sex. So that, that's a very another very interesting song on here. And the song Little League sees Conan regretting how, or possibly questioning if, becoming an adult means abandoning the innocent playfulness of youth. So that's, you know, that's a message I think we can all uh, take to heart in some ways. Now, Conan Gray's songs are, on average, are more up-tempo in terms of melodies and arrangements than you would find on the typical Troy Sivan album, let's say. But here, they run the gamut between high-energy, synth-drenched indie pop type of stuff to the more intimate, delicate, acoustic balladry. And that makes for a really varied album that never gets boring. And uh, this album is a little on the short side. He, To his credit, he keeps it kind of short and sweet. It's, I think the album is maybe 35 minutes long. But honestly, I enjoyed it enough that I could have seen a couple more songs on this album, maybe stretch it out to uh, the 40-minute mark, because I really enjoyed it. And in some ways, it's, it's almost over too soon. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, check out Conan Gray if you haven't yet. G good, good album. Okay, the next two CDs I'm going to be talking about today have a little something in common. You'll find out soon enough what that commonality is. First up, we have Louis Tomlinson's solo debut album, Walls. Now, my heart goes out to Louis, honestly, uh, because this album was almost destined for an uphill battle. First of all, he's a former One Directioner, so he was inevitably going to be measured up against the dashing charm of Niall Horan and the sexy charisma of Harry Styles, which would be unfair competition even if they didn't all come from the same pop group, honestly. Uh, and secondly, you can't even really think about releasing an album nowadays without it having something that sets it apart from the crowd. An innovative sound, really striking vocals, a distinctive image of the artist, and, well, Louis Tomlinson's debut album, Walls, has none of that. But that's not a bad thing, and it doesn't automatically mean this is a mediocre album. Because I've never really needed those distinctions to get enjoyment out of an album or to find it worthy of my time. And in fact, this album reminds me a lot of a time late 90s, I think it was, when I was enjoying a steady stream of just plain good pop music. And that's what this album is. Now, the opening track, Kill My Mind, is a great upbeat rocker, 
Although the, the one nitpick I have with that song is that it is a little misleading in that uh, none of the other tracks in the album are quite as high energy, so it kind of leads you to uh, falsely assume that the rest of the album is going to be like that if you haven't listened to it yet. Uh, but then there's the song We Made It, which has that irregular time signature and lyrical meter, which kind of makes it grab the ear. And the, then there's the title track and Don't Let It Break Your Heart, which are both solid mid-tempo songs. And uh, now I implied that this album was nothing distinctive, but that's not to say that none of the songs are impactful in some way, uh, in terms of the lyrics. Two of Us makes me get a little misty-eyed because it seems to be about a dearly departed love, loved one, so naturally it makes me think of my sister. And then there's a song Perfect Now, which is one of those songs about someone who thinks they're worthless, but in fact mean the world to somebody else. And songs with that message always just tug at my heartstrings. I, I just can't help but you know, I, I love those songs, what can I say? But all in all, this is a pretty solid album, and I can forgive it for having an identical title and a very similar cover to uh, Barbara Streisand's most recent album. In fact, if you put them this way, it almost looks like she's trying to reach him because she, she knows he's on the other side of the wall. But anyway, uh, Louis Tomlinson may have been the last One Directioner to put out a solo album, and this material may be the closest to, some might say, indistinguishable from One Direction sound, but hey, in my opinion that is no strike against it, uh, and he does it perfectly well. He does this album perfectly well, and he ranks a solid third place in my favorite One Direction alumni. Honestly, this is a, this is a good, good album. Very solid album. Okay, and now for the penultimate album in today's video. We have Heartbreak Weather, the sophomore album by Niall Horan. Now, I loved Niall's debut, Flicker, so I bought the CD the first chance that I could, almost as soon as it came out. And I listened to it several times right away, but it was at the same time that all the craziness of the last few months uh, got started, and so I was really distracted. I had a hell of a time focusing on it until just the last month, six weeks or so. But now that I have, I can say that this is one of my favorite albums of the year so far. Now this carries forward the epic, echoey, kind of sweeping sound of his debut album, but I think this one surpasses Flickr just a bit, not by a whole lot. Uh, one of the most striking tracks on this album is Bend the Rules with the gorgeous refrain in its chorus. It just gives me chills every time I listen to it. Uh, another one of my favorites is the power ballad Arms of a Stranger with the kind of a time signature change up in its chorus. That really uh, makes it stand out. And Dear Patience is a lovely ballad with shimmering guitar flourishes that almost give me goosebumps when I hear it. Uh, another one of the great songs on this album is Cross Your Mind. It reminds me, for some reason, of early 80s pop, uh, or, or the more Fleetwood Mac-ish moments on his debut album. And of course I love the other singles, Black and White and Nice to Meet You. Those were just fantastic. They deserved every bit of the attention that they got. And one way in which this album differs from Flickr is that there seem to be more R&B-based jams. Uh, Small Talk has kind of a sexy bedroom vibe, kind of a smooth little thing going on. New Angel has a bit more of an upbeat feel, reminds me kind of of uh, early 80s Michael Jackson. And then we have the great single No Judgment with much more of a contemporary R&B sound to it. So as you can tell from my gushing about this album, it is just fantastic. It's an awesome follow-up to Flickr. It has a whole bunch of great standout moments on it. And there are going to have to be more than a few seriously superior albums for this one to not make my top five at the end of this year. It's just fantastic. Heartbreak Weather by Niall Horan. Go check it out if you haven't yet. Okay, last but certainly not least. Uh, in fact, in a way, it's last but most because I think I might enjoy this album the most out of all the ones on this video. Uh, so much so that I saw fit to buy it on vinyl. We have Dua Lipa's sophomore album, Future Nostalgia. Now, I haven't exactly made it a secret that I tend to overlook female pop singers much more frequently than I do male pop singers. And it's not for any sexist reason. It's just because I tend not to like them with nearly as much regularity as male pop singers. I, I feel like I hear more variation amongst male voices than I do female, female voices. So as kind of a natural result, not as many female voices stand out to me. But when I finally do wake up and take notice of an artist like Dua Lipa, it makes me wish I could break myself of that habit and just, you know, pay more attention overall to female voices because I almost missed somebody like Dua Lipa. Now, I listened to all the reviews by my friends and other YouTubers and, and you know, Red Magazine reviews and all that, and the nearly unanimous praise and repeated references to an 80s sonic aesthetic convinced me that I had to check this album out. And 
The buzz was definitely well earned by Dua Lipa. This album is simply dripping with 80s pop influences and being an 80s kid myself you can imagine how much appeal I find in this album's songs. Nearly every song has an impeccably crafted chorus or an irresistible rhythm or a super catchy hook or some mixture of all three. Uh, Levitating is one of the great tracks on here. It has what seems like a natural mix of a perfect beat and a catchy melody. Almost as though the song feels like it's always existed, in a way. Uh, Love Again is another example of a ridiculously earwormy song that was tailor-made for radio. And Hallucinate has an almost hypnotic 21st century dynamic to it. Uh, but Physical harkens back to the 80s hit of the same name by Olivia Newton-John. So there are some throwback uh, bits in some of the songs. And speaking of authentic 80s ingredients, so to speak, the song Break My Heart is another standout track that ingeniously interpolates the song Need You Tonight by NXS. Uh, and then we have the song Cool, which is a standout ballad-leaning track with its more understated, moody R&B synths. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the little flourishes like the cowbell on Pretty Please. So this album just has so much to, so much to offer, really. Uh, the only arguable misstep on the album is the song Good In Bed, whose biggest offense is the rather cheesy chorus, and I have a pretty high tolerance for cheese, so if I'm going to say something is cheesy, trust me, it's cheesy. I, I can tell Dua Lipa wanted to have fun with this one, but there is such a thing as, as too much fun, honestly. And then, then the closing track, Boys Will Be Boys, has a message in the lyrics that's well worth examining. Um, the misogyny uh, that's rampant in our culture right now, the object objectification of women that uh, seems to uh, have been flourishing lately. But I'm not sure if its placement at the end of the album works. Uh, maybe it should have been closer to the middle. Although maybe the way it leaves the audience with something to think about makes sense. So maybe she's onto something after all in that, in the placement of that track. Uh, but yeah, overall, this is a fantastic, nearly flawless album, which will almost definitely end up on my favorite albums of the year list. I, and it's probably going to be in the top five at this rate. And it will certainly make me check out Dua Lipa's debut album as well. So yeah, excellent album if you haven't listened to it yet. Future Nostalgia by Dua Lipa. Well, there we go. I think that catches me up for right now anyway. That'll do it for Spank and Platters for the spring of 2020, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.